Let yeah. me show you how it's done. Well, well, welcome. You are listening to The Drop, 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 podcast on business tech and influence. I am one half of The Drop, Tam Danier, head of strategy. I lead insights and product. I focus on tech, in particular, solutions that solve real world problems. And I'm here with... My name is B. Pagels Minor. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I have been a product manager for over a decade at some of the world's most well-respected companies like Sprout Social, Apple, and Netflix. I've led teams that built important parts of the App Store, launched games at Netflix, built listening at Sprout Social. All in all, my DNA is fully being a product manager. The other morning, I sent you a message and I said, Tam, I literally miss taxis. Like, I miss taxis. It's simpler. I don't understand what's going on. And the reason for that was I was having a small medical procedure. And because we have a kid, we decided that it would make the most sense for me to take an Uber there. And then my wife would pick me up. And the cheapest Uber was like $112 for an 18 minute ride. I mean, it true. It was at 515 in the morning. But I remember back in the day, I could call my local taxi service and it would cost me like 20, 25 bucks to do the exact same thing. So, you know, I had this like this moment where I was just like, is Uber actually convenient? As we continue our, our product market fit series, it's not just who's winning. It's not why would it fail? There's also this question of how do you actually make it make sense? And I think that that's, that's Uber's a great place to have that conversation. When I, I messaged Sam this weekend, I was like, this is what I would love to talk about because I, I'm very curious about your thoughts on this. Let's talk about a few of the different headlines that are kind of going on here that are pressuring Uber. Uber has made the decision to partner with the Yellow Taxi Cabs in New York City. If folks remember, that's one of the, so between New York City, San Francisco, LA, those different places, one of the reasons there was so much uh, desire for regulation for Uber was simply because of the fact that they were putting the taxi industry out of service. And New York especially was a, a, a very different type of taxi situation because at the time when Uber was coming around, people used to borrow millions of dollars to buy taxi medallions so that they could drive. With the advent of Uber, it actually bankrupted so many of the people who are in the taxi industry in New York. So it's very fascinating that Uber is now going to partner with New York City's taxis. You also are looking at the fact that there's lots of complaints from the different Uber drivers about inflation, about the gas prices, and how that's messing with their particular margins. Also, Uber has really pushed into the market to be this delivery service with Uber Eats. But you've also seen so many things in the news about them exiting like Zomato and different cities around the world because they just haven't been able to make the numbers work. That also goes for the Uber driving service as well. You also have their CEO basically saying, for the first time, we really have to focus and make ourselves more efficient and more effective if we want to survive this crisis. First question you have to start talking about is like, what does it even mean, you know, as your turn is starting to evaluate Uber, that they have to partner with taxi services now? And I'm actually remembering something. I had a conversation. It was a drunken conversation, I think, in Chicago, like a few years ago, where this really smart business strategist guy was just like, Uber will only make sense when they don't have to depend on drivers. Them having to partner with taxis is a great example of that continued reliance on drivers. What does the dependence on drivers what does it really mean for Uber? I think if this is a question about product market fit, it's one of those Uber hangs in the balance of what is product market fit? Do you have enough people willing to use your product that you can sustain a business out of it? And there's a couple tentacles or prongs to that three-sided stool. On the one hand, there's desirability. Do people want this? Are you solving a problem? And I think squarely the answer is yes. Uber has proven a point that people need a way to get from point A to point B. As a matter of fact, the Taxi License Commission has already proven that point whenever they created the taxis, that people need a way to get from point A to point B that is not themselves driving them there. That point has been proven. What Uber tried to do is say they need a better user experience. And I do believe that they have usability, another prong in this product market fit. I do believe that they've achieved usability. Unfortunately, feasibility is extremely simple. I mean, they, they built a simple concept that's allowed for competition to occur pretty quickly. And so viability is at stake because the barriers of entry into this market are so low. All it really takes is a lot of marketing dollars 
It makes viability for any single player dependent on your ability to capture that market share. And so that's where Uber is right now. Can we survive as a business? Can we become profitable? I don't think Uber has to worry about usage. They're doing a million rides a day. Is that their number? You got to quote me on that. But they're doing a staggering amount of rides per day. So in the desirability usage category, you have to say they have succeeded there. They have a lot of competition. And so they're sharing that market share, which makes their ability to charge whatever they want to charge unviable. They can't do it. So viability is a problem. Uber's problem is that they have poor execution. They are not really strong at developing unique insights and they're not strong at product development. And so they can't really execute on ideas very well. And that's really what their struggle is right now. And because of that, what they're leaning on a little too strongly is in acquisitions. They're investing in international growth, trying to buy up startups or invest in in other markets. As you said, Zomato, this is what they're leaning on. And in ridiculous amounts of marketing spend just to keep brand recognition out there. I think when the new CEO came in, Dara, one of the things that he did was have their marketing spend and saw no impact in change in results. They were spending $900 million a year in marketing. Have that and got the same results. They're extremely inefficient and they're just not good at executing really well. But I think that that can be changed. Will Uber still be around? Will the concept of mobility still be a, a category? I think so. The beginnings of Uber were very growth focused, growth at all costs as all startups are. And so they try things in a very fast fashion that gets them users. But at a certain point, when you've established desirability, this very important part of part of market fit that people do want this, the next step is to increase usage or the long-term commitment of that customer. And that's what they're having a lot of trouble with because unfortunately they're in an industry that again, that is very easy to enter. So people are price sensitive. Uber is simply a platform that connects multiple players together. And they don't have total control of all the behaviors and mechanisms of all of those players. These are the multi-sided marketplaces. They're very hard to control these, to keep all of these animals in the playpen. And so you have the needs of the drivers, which their costs are ever increasing. And hey, we want more take-home pay. So if you can't satisfy the needs of the drivers, then they're going to abandon the app. But if they abandon the app, then on the user side, the rider side, they're not going to be able to get the experience that they want, which is a ride on time to the place that I need to go. This is a battle of balancing both sides, how to keep both sides happy while taking a profit. There is a limit to each side. There is a limit to the rider side of how much they're willing to pay for that ride to get to the other side, because there's so many other options. They can simply take the taxi. They can call a friend they can walk. They can take the bus. There's all kinds of ways to do it. They could simply just decide to own a car or drive themselves. And so there are other options to get to the other side of town. So you can't price it to an unlimited amount and extract that amount from the market. So you're capped by that, but you also have to price that enough that you can pay these drivers enough in order to incentivize them to keep working on the platform and take a profit. You've got a really hard job to do. And I think that what Uber is learning is unfortunately they are operating in a space where it's essential worker type work and people don't get rich off of that kind of work. You're basically in the business of labor issues, much like a Walmart is, much like McDonald's is. You know, Walmart has proven the point that people want cheap goods, cheap CPGs, but nobody's rich working at Walmart, right? This is not, you're not going to make a lot of money working at Walmart. McDonald's has been around how long? People, McDonald's has proven the point that people want fast food. Nobody's rich working at McDonald's. And I think Uber is just one of those companies. 
think we kind of stumbled into an interesting point that I think needs to be made. You just described a couple of other industries that have worker problems. And I really do believe that these types of businesses that are very low margin, high turnover businesses, they all have like the same desire, which is, can we just not have to deal with people? How few people can we use to get our value from this. So if you walk into the Taco Bell now, or even isn't McDonald's too, I think you have the completely automated screens and you can go through them and use those instead of going to the counter and placing your order. Amazon has already tested these grocery stores that just dynamically knows what you're buying through recording and some other types of devices to know what's in your shopping cart. So when you walk out of the store, it knows how much to charge you. These are all different industries, but they all have the same problem, which is workers are the most expensive part of their business. And in some ways it almost, it would make sense. It's like they need to innovate themselves out of needing so many workers, right? And so it comes back to this general idea of how does innovation play into your business so that your business margins make sense because business fundamentals make sense. And so business fundamentals are, you have to make a product that you can make for cheaper than you sell it for. It's a very simple principle. There's nothing crazy dynamic about that. It's like you need to be able to make some money off of this thing. I think there's a deeper insight there. And I think it's that if in the early days of Uber, they thought, hey, we're going to take the Walmart route or the Amazon route, meaning we will make money at scale, which is a common belief in a lot of these low margin types of business. We'll make the money at volume, which is what Walmart does, which is what Amazon does. In the case of a Walmart or Amazon, they own the vertical Mm-hmm. They, they own the supply chain. They own the, what happens behind the scenes. Those deals that are being made are unknown to the customer. All we see is something on the shelf that we choose to buy. But in this case, both sides are known to the market. It's exposed. You're asking me, the customer, to pay essentially the salary of my driver. But at the end of the day, what is the value of that good? So you kind of put us in a tenuous situation and maybe they were relying on us to be genuous with our tips in order to pay that but that's just not american culture we're talking about i'm going deep into insights and we're going to do a podcast later about the value of an insight is that really every business is really just operating or trading on human behavior i'm going back to this uh, broader insight about product market fit all we are doing is trading on human behavior and apparently American human behavior, not this altruistic in terms of commerce. The idea that you're going to get the consumer to subsidize the livelihood of your employee, we have not come around to that, to being able to do that, which is why I don't think that that's working for them. Drivers want more money. They want to make livable wages, but riders don't want to pay a lot to get from point A to point B. I was in Nebraska last week for a conference and I wanted to take an Uber to go to dinner and it took 25 minutes to have an Uber get to me in Nebraska. This is actually no shade about Nebraska. This is shade about Uber because that's the other part of it. If you want me to really be bought into a service, it needs to work no matter which city or state or town I'm in. That's the other part of it because you're dealing with parts of this country where it just, it doesn't make sense. There's not enough demand or there's not enough. It's a, it's against the cultural value. For instance, when I'm back home in Mississippi, I can find an Uber if I need to, but it's pretty abnormal. And in fact, some of my family members will say, well, why don't you just call one of us? We would have picked you up. That's literally what they would say. And I'm like, I didn't want to inconvenience you, right? That's, that's what I say, but it's so abnormal to them from a cultural perspective that they're just like, well, you could have just called one of us. And so that's the other part of it is that, especially in this type of business that it works in areas that are outside of typical urban areas. But I, I don't want to stick too hard on just the driving part of this, because I do think that there's something to the fact that they have Uber Eats. They have Uber Freight. So Uber Freight and Uber Eats are both interesting to me. Uber Freight, especially because when you think about freight services, it's about efficiency and effectiveness. While I think it's difficult to do Uber on demand in a way that's super effective, especially for the drivers who are trying to optimize and make as much money as possible. I do think Uber Freight has a lot of potential. I think Uber Freight plus, you know, self-driving trucks and things like that has a lot of potential too. A lot of people's business models, and I think, you know, Amazon and 
Google and Apple has made lots of people think that it's going to work for them. Expand into adjacent industries and you just kind of keep adding on and on and on. And the, the goal is, is that through all of that scale, you eventually become a profitable company. And to your point earlier, Tam, but the simple reality is sometimes it's actually better to be small, right? Because you can be really good at this thing that that's a, that's a smaller business. You'd be really effective and you can win at it. And so Uber Freight to me is actually one of the things that I think they should focus more time and energy on because the freight industry is, is complicated. And being a third party who built software to make that efficient makes sense to me. It makes more sense to me than even Uber Eats or Uber's driving service. Here's the drop. It takes a lot of money to create a behavior. It takes a lot of money to create a behavior. The need of getting from point A to point B, that is an everlasting need that always existed. Prehistoric times, we've always needed a way to get from point A to point B. It was a horse carrying a carriage. Then it became a car. We've had trains. We've had the buses. We've always had these ways. And Uber comes along and says, I want to create this other method of getting around from point A to point B, and I want to do it at scale. Not introducing a new need, just introducing a new way of doing things. That's the behavior. And it costs them billions of dollars to train people, B, to be so comfortable with picking up their phone and swiping on an app to order a car that for some of them, They've created a lifestyle around them. For those that said, I'm not going to go buy a car because I'm just going to rely on Uber. That's the behavior that Uber has created. For those people that moved to another city, I know somebody moved from Seattle to Miami without a car because he relies on Uber or these ride sharing. That did not exist. Uber has spent a lot of money to create the ride sharing economy. The ability to hire a car to come directly to you and pick you up and go someplace else was a premium product. That's the only way that that business model survived was that it had to be a premium product. You had to really need this service and be willing to pay more for it because we need to pay people a livable wage in order to have that driver there. But at the level that you needed to be Walmart prices, there's no way that we can create this business and have a respectable business model. And so while we had this concierge service, the limo driver, the private shuttle service and things like that, which was always kind of expensive and yet wasn't as available as Uber, the creation of Uber meant that we now created a whole new economic model, not just Uber, but the entire category of people fighting to stay alive, it created a lopsided economic model. What you're saying makes sense, right? It became so difficult to consistently get an Uber where I lived before I moved to my new location. I actually found a third party service, a local third party service that is my go to airport service. So every single time I book a flight, the next thing I do is to send a picture of my flight information to the service. And then the, they send me a text back saying, we're picking up at this time. And what's great about that, I will often hire, like, let's say an Uber black car, right? Which is a little bit more expensive. But the idea behind an Uber black car is that, you know, they're supposed to open the door for you. They're supposed to be like better drivers and it's supposed to be sophisticated. And so this airport service I use is essentially the same people who would come from the Uber black service. But the difference is, is that the airport service actually does open the door for you. When I'm at the airport, they'll actually come over and get my bag for me. And and, and what's so interesting is going back to this, like the original question, which is like, I kind of miss taxis. It also, when you think about it from that luxurious standpoint too, it actually does not execute in the same way. Even though you're getting these people who are supposedly black car level service, they don't do black car service. And that's partially going back to your idea, which is these drivers are just like, well, we're only getting paid so much. So you don't, you actually haven't earned the black car service that you supposedly booked. And that's part of the problem. You're 100% right. I cannot stand when a Tesla Uber comes by to pick me up because this is someone who did not want to be an Uber driver, but they've got to pay that Tesla bill. And now they're an Uber driver. It is the worst experience because there's no concierge service. They are not going to get out the car, to open up the trunk to put your luggage in there. They do not want to be seen putting your luggage in their Tesla truck. Uber didn't change direction in their strategy. They focused so much on growth and that's all they did, that they didn't focus on differentiation. They should have realized, and I say this with all sympathy because we, we've talked about this before, that building an app is extremely easy. Building a business is extremely hard. And here you have a company like Uber who I can say, has proven a point 
and still it's very hard to make it a business. There's this fallacy about first mover advantage that it's an advantage to be the first mover and the fallacy is proven to be false over and over again. The first mover proves a point. It's usually the one that comes after that starts reaping the rewards. Google was not the first search engine. Apple was not the first computer. Historically, this has happened over and over and over again. And here is Uber who has clearly proven this point and somehow cannot get the business model right, though this the CEO was trying very hard. I think recently they did turn a profitable quarter. Why did they turn profitable? Because the pandemic was in their favor and they had Uber Eats and delivery went up, which goes back to what it takes for them to win. Pure market share. And they're in a war with DoorDash about just extracting market share. They need to start focusing in on where the differentiation is. You need a deeper insight into what it's going to take to move this needle and come to grips with what is a business model at scale. As one of these people who for a time did not have a car because Uber's all I needed. I was a traveling consultant. I lived in downtown. Everything was very local. When I was working, I was on a plane. When I was home, I was home. So I didn't really need a car. And then I moved to the suburbs or the suburban area and Uber's just not suitable for it. So they've not been able to convert uh, someone who needs to get from point A to point B every once in a while to someone who's just going to rely on Uber because you can't deliver on the service to your point about when you hire a concierge, you have this certain level of, of service that you expect. Uber does not deliver on a service. They really just stayed in the space of peer-to-peer connection. That was their missed opportunity to create an Uber-like experience that we could expect. You need to focus on what makes Uber the, ch- the choice app of any customer because it's not on the experience. On both sides, again, this is a very hard thing to do. I'm back at you. To round up that point, I'm a very value conscious person. And I think many people are. And when we say value, it's not simply, am I getting my money's worth? It is how convenient, like, especially when you think about the food service, especially when you think about the driving service, even when you thought about the scooters, right? How do you make sure that Uber has such a consistent experience that I want to use it If you're going to charge me the 125 versus the like 25 or 30 or 40 bucks that I would be paying if I was using a plain old taxi, I need that car to make sense. It's very difficult to do that in the model that they've created. And so what we've essentially said is we can't wait to see how they pivot. What's your advice to to Uber? What should they be focusing on? So if I were truly Uber, I focus on the freight business and the food delivery business. I think the food delivery business, just because you can do it with far less drivers, you can do many more orders. I think that they could actually create something really, really interesting and consistent there. I think that they should probably get out of the mobility space. I think the mobility space, honestly, they could probably sell their business to someone who wants to focus, for instance, solely in North America, solely in South America. They could actually break up their business and I think sell it for a decent amount amount of money to local operators who don't have that need to scale in the same way. And I think it would be much more effective for them long term. I agree and slightly off to the side on some of your points. I think that they have an opportunity with Uber Eats. I also think they have an opportunity with Uber. A start with Uber Eats, they have an opportunity to really hone in and own the delivery space and create something special. But I think that the opportunity is going to be on the restaurant side. What's going to make restaurants want to choose Uber as a delivery partner? They have an opportunity to dive a little bit deeper into the vertical of restaurants and figure out what problems they can solve beyond just delivering food from point A to point B. I also think that they can do traveling better. I think that you you know they created a better experience about ordering a car but they really tried to take what was a niche market and try to make it mass and they're running into a lot of problems there are just some things that don't scale but i don't want uber to go away i need uber uber does have a purpose it serves as a lot of use cases i think if they could figure out a way to keep it profitable but not being so mass or find something else that is more mass, then uh, they can keep Uber as just a luxury good. I mean, it did start off as a black service. Uber pool is struggling. There's a lot of parts of this model that are struggling. I think they need to disown (laughs) some of those things. I do think they have an opportunity to do mass transit better. 
the concept of a jitney is is not new. This exists even in in developing countries in the Caribbean. This kind of tap tap, this kind of car thing that goes on in places like Memphis. Again, talking about how expensive it is to create a behavior. It was not a behavior in Memphis, Tennessee, where you're from, right? That's where you're from, right? Be in Memphis, Tennessee, be ordering private cars. Of course, Uber's not going to work there. That is really expensive to create that new behavior. They do need better public transportation, something that is more reliable. You can iterate on that experience. I like to really know how far away that bus is so I'm not just standing there in the rain, right? Things like that. You can do that very, again, I don't think they're very good at developing a proper insight. This is not that hard about taking a current need that exists and making it better for the user to attain that adoption and diving deeper into the user experience because desirability is already there. Feasibility is an answered question. It's about viability. I think they need to focus on that. So I do think they have an opportunity in mass transit. Uber should probably go back to being more of a niche product. And Uber Eats is an opportunity on the restaurant side to create deeper relationships there. As you were talking, I realized, you know, they actually could just be the software service for mobility, right? You know, people are like, well, I use Uber Tech for my mobility service. You know, I use Uber Tech for my restaurant, right? So why does Uber have to be the deliverer of the service? Why couldn't they just help incentivize and, and make that happen? Because that's the most expensive part. They'd have to get their product development team. So I've heard stories that their hiring process is insanely difficult, but this to our point of like product management and everything else, you know, just because your interview yeah. process is hard doesn't mean that your actual process is good. Thank you so much for listening to the Drops Podcast. We love having you. We love your feedback. Please do connect with us across social media. We are the Drops Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And we also have a great email, the Drops Podcast at gmail.com. You can